Let's pray. So, Father, for the task of preaching your word and for the duty of listening with an open and eager and hungry heart, we ask your divine blessing, your divine power, and we pray that you would be glorified in all things, in the preaching, in the listening, in the taking your word away, uh, the word away into our hearts and our minds and into our lives. With the message, press us individually and corporately into the image of Jesus Christ, your Son, to the end that we remain salt and light as we are in Him in a dead world, a dark world, a demonic world. Thank you, Father, that you have ordained that through the church, your wisdom is made clear to the principalities and powers. So we know as we physically assemble, there is a divine assembly, both of the holy and the unholy angels. So come, bring salvation to the lost, those you've ordained to be in, in Christ from the foundation of the world. And come, be the healer of your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you would, please get a Bible and find the book of Leviticus. Yes. I said it, Leviticus. It's not a typo in my notes. But Pastor Mark, it's been a year of heartache. I need help with school. My new boyfriend or girlfriend. My marriage is breaking down. No, it's actually broken down. I need help with raising my kids. I'm struggling with COVID. I need help in dealing with loneliness and depression. I need guidance with the workplace. I'm struggling with what to do with the latter years of my life. Leviticus? Seriously? Pastor Mark. Don't you know this Tuesday, America elects who the president is going to be? We have some Christians who may vote Biden in with the Democrats' antichrist policies. Convince them otherwise. Ooh, I feel the presence of the Lord up here. Woo. Also, we have Christians that have chosen to to not even vote. Convince them to vote. The nation's future is on the line, Pastor Mark, and you want us to go to Leviticus? What does Leviticus have to do with where I'm at and what I need and what we need as a nation? And if you've been around me long enough by now, you know the answer is, oh, you don't know. Bethany knows. Say it, Bethany. Amen. But what does Leviticus Leviticus has to do with our lives? Answer, everything. There you go. Everything. And my job today, my task in calling from God is to help bridge the gap, right, to close the gap. And this has been very convicting to me. Amen. Leviticus is the word of God. Bethany uh, said the longer answer rather than the short word, everything. God's word is sufficient for the needs of God's people, and that includes Leviticus. Now, I want to address why Leviticus is so foreign to us. I want to address this from a prophetic perspective and from a pastoral perspective. Would you let me do that? And personally, in me trying to uh, uh, wrap my brain around Leviticus, I've been really convicted big time by the Lord. I confess that I have neglected this book, and I have never preached from Leviticus 
I have nor, nor a series of messages from Leviticus, and I'm here to confess to you as a, as a man of God, as a pastor, as an elder, that's bad. That's bad. So as your pastor for about 11 years, I want to confess that to you and ask for your forgiveness. Seriously. In several ways, I am unfortunately a man of the times. I've allowed the spirit of the age to influence me and affect and impact ministry. From a prophetic perspective, the reason why we neglect Leviticus is because we often neglect God. You've heard me say that before, right? To neglect God's word is to neglect whom? God. The reason why we neglect God is because we often love other things and other people more than God, and usually they're good things and good people. That's what idolatry is. Another reason is because we're lazy. Look at the person to your left or right in the eye and say, you're lazy. Go ahead. I'll wait. Those of you online, please participate with us. Can we confess that? We are lazy people. I see some self-righteous people over looking at me like your stone cold face, all right? Yeah, it's time to repent up in here. Amen. We usually filter most things in our lives through the lens of our own self. We are self-centered people. Jesus knows that. That's why he says, deny what? (laughs) Yourself. Take up a cross. We process the Bible through our self-centered lens. How does this play out? (laughs) The book does not immediately hit us where we live. We approach the Bible on our terms, not on the terms of the original audience or author. So it plays out like this. In January, let's read the whole Bible together. Go through it, right? In January, let's do it. And by February, we run into Leviticus. And what happens? We pooter out. Been there, done that. Amen. From a pastoral perspective, let's begin with something familiar. One of the best-known Bible verses is, quote, love your neighbor as yourself. One of the least-known facts is that this verse is found in Leviticus 19, uh, 18. And when it's seen in context, it's about a whole lot more than being nice and mowing your neighbor's lawn when they're sick. A whole lot more than that. So there's much treasure to be found in the book of Leviticus, but we must mine it in the right way. We must dig for it. We must work for the treasure. For example, are you ready for this? There's a man, now an Old Testament scholar, named Jack Sklar. Why do, why do professors and academics have weird names all the time? Have you noticed that? S-K-L-A-R, Jack, rather J. Sklar. He studied the book of Leviticus for over 10 years. And all God's people said, why? Or, oh me. He studied and researched his Ph.D. uh, under the excellent, well-known Old Testament scholar named Gordon uh, Wenham. Uh, W-E-N-H-A-N, Gordon Wenham. Now, J. Sklar teaches on the book in seminary. This is what he said, quote, In my experience, at least four profound things happen when this book, Leviticus, begins to seep into your soul. Number one, you hunger for God's holiness more frequently. Number two, you fear God more greatly. Number three, you love Jesus more deeply. And number four, you love your neighbor more fully. That's a man who saturated his spirit, mind, and soul in Leviticus for over ten years in an academic way. I think these are needed in my life. How about you? How about in your family? Do you think these could help us get through 2020 and the rest of the years God grants us? Oh, yeah, amen. You hunger for God's holiness more frequently. You fear God more greatly. You love Jesus more deeply, and you love your neighbor more fully. Oh, yes. Now, as an uh, overview today of Leviticus, I want to basically address three areas and then offer some personal practical uh, implications, all right? So let me show you from a a bird's eye perspective, God willing, what we're going to do today. So I want to show you the structure of it, 
then some guiding principles, and then I'm going to pull four overarching truths from the context and the structure of the book of Leviticus into our lives. All right? So let's hit the structure of Leviticus very quickly. There are different... Excuse me. There are different outlines out there on Leviticus. You will find also that some people say, hey, there is no structure to the book. Okay? But I think the best outline on Leviticus is the one that sees a symmetry or a balance to the book. And those of you that remember, um, uh, what's that thing called that goes like this, X marks the spot, a chiasmus. Those of you that uh, know what a chiasmus is, yeah, that's the whole book of uh, Levit- Leviticus. There's a German scholar named Eric Zinger who published an article on the outline that I'm offering you. And I want to show this to you in a visual way. Okay, you can get it visually. Now, the reason why I like this particular structure is because it answers the question or the dilemma at issue. And that is this How can corrupt Israelites live near God's goodness without being destroyed? How many of you think it's good to be in the presence of God? Raise your hand. How many of you think that it's also dangerous to be in the presence of God? Amen. You've seen me, right, with Exodus, right? uh, Exodus was Egypt, the place of civil and spiritual uh, uh, bondage. And then uh, the wilderness was uh, the question mark on whether uh, God's people are going to trust him to provide. And it's all climactic uh, heading up to what? Mount Sinai, where It's the presence of God. You remember the lightning bolt that I showed you? That's what it's like to be in the presence of God. Think lightning bolt or think sun. We love the sun. It brings light. It brings uh, warmth. Yeah, you get too close to the sun, what's going to happen? You're going to get fried, annihilated. And the book of Exodus ends with, after all of the laws pertaining to the building of the tabernacle, right? So God is restoring what was lost in Eden, right? At the end of the book of Exodus, Moses cannot enter because of the glory of God. That's a problem. Leviticus, so the the biblical narrative from Genesis, Exodus, and when we get to Leviticus, it slows down. (laughs) I like to call the book of uh, Leviticus like one of the four gospels in the Old Testament. Think of it like that. Think of Leviticus like the gospel of Matthew. Or Mark, Luke, and John. It's the gospel in that time and place for the nation of Israel. It restores what was lost in Eden, which is the manifest presence of God, God with man. So let's see this from a a, a visual way. All right, so you got the the ritual, priesthood, and purity. Now watch this, really cool. Chapters 1 to 7 and 23 to 27 are about sacrifice and feast day regulations. Then when we get to the priesthood, check this out. Chapters 8 to 10, then 21 to 22, all about the priesthood. And then when you get to the purity laws, you'll see that in 11 through 15 and also 18 to 20. All this structure serves to highlight the very heart of the book. Which is what? The Day of Atonement. That's 16 and 17. The Day of Atonement. All right? So take a picture of that. That is the structure of the book. X marks the spot. In this case, if you look at it from a chiasmus perspective, it's about the Day of Atonement. That's the heart of the book. Remember when we went through the book of the Revelation? What's the heart of the book? Revelation 12. And they overcame him, that is the devil, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Bible is one unified story that leads us to Jesus. Amen. All right, so that's the structure. Now let's go to uh, guiding principles very quickly. Number one, understand the book in its own context, including the weird stuff. (laughs) And there's a lot of weird stuff in this book. Seriously. I mean, things like reproductive and menstrual fluid and just like weird stuff. Amen. Every culture has its own taboos, right? Have I lost anyone yet? Are you with me? Every culture has its own taboos. For example, (laughs) would it be weird to sit on the toilet and eat your food? (laughs) Uh, I think we would all say yes. 
Yes, right? We would all say, that's gross. I can't believe you even used the word toilet in the pulpit for crying out loud. This makes me nervous, right? That's taboo to us. You just don't sit on the toilet and eat your food, right? Sitting on the toilet somehow messes up the food, right? Absolutely. By the way, did you know that a keyboard is dirtier than a toilet seat, right? All right, so all you keyboardists out there, sorry about that. Wash your hands afterwards, amen. I know I'm going to get in trouble with Donna on that when she was playing this morning. And Okay. Eating your meal while on the toilet seat is taboo. <clears throat> okay, follow me now. There's a method to my madness. Follow me now. Then why are we okay with putting a brush into our mouth in the uh, bathroom and brush our teeth? On the mission field in India, American missionaries built houses with bathrooms in them because they didn't have them. What a great idea, right? How nice. How thoughtful of the American missionaries. How expensive. Well, guess what? The American missionaries forgot to check with the Indians. And when the Americans built the Indians the new houses with indoor bathrooms with plumbing, they would not move into the new houses. Why? Because everyone knows you don't put a bathroom inside your home in that part of India. How gross. What you do in the bathroom is for outside of the home. Good grief, don't you know that? That was taboo for them. So, all this to say, we have to be sympathetic to the ancient Israelites as it relates to their laws that God gave Israel for their time and their space, okay? That's, the, that's what it means. And if we do, oh, we're going to see some treasures in Leviticus. And our love and affection for Jesus will only increase. Quickly, number two, the laws and regulations protect sacred space. That's a key guiding principle Leviticus is all about protecting sacred space, God's space. Number three, to be unclean or impure was not to be sinful. It meant you were ritually disqualified from the sacred space until you became ritually clean or pure. Okay? There's some laws on there. You become ritually unclean. It's not sinful. You just can't go into sacred space. Wait seven days, take a bath, good to go. You may now enter sacred space. Okay? Number three is really huge. Number four, the laws and festivals restore and maintain access, again, to sacred space, God's presence, God's power, for ancient Israel. One of the reasons why we're not going to Leviticus, we neglect it, is because by its nature and by its covenant, it is obsolete for us in Jesus Christ. It's obsolete. And then number five, avoid ripping verses out of their context. Example, tattoos. All right? For example... People quote Leviticus 19, 28. You shall not make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. But they don't quote the whole verse, which says, You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Okay? The cutting of the body and the tattoo marks were involved in Canaanite pagan rituals related to the worship of dead ancestors. Okay? It is a misappropriation of God's word to rip that out of the verse's context and use it as a legalistic anti-tattoo verse unless you're tattooing yourself with a picture of grandma and praying to her on the anniversary date of her death. Okay? So now let's get into the theology of the book. All right? The, The theology of the book. Four ways to live near God's presence. I think in your bulletin it has to live 
in God's presence. I think both are appropriate, but I think I like near better in the context of Leviticus. All right, so let's go. Number one, God provided a way to live near his presence through a ritual. And this is seen in chapters one through seven, and then it's mirrored, it's symmetrical in cha- uh, chapters 23 to 27. There's an important theological word in these chapters and throughout Leviticus, and that is the word atonement. Say atonement, right? And let's look at it in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Leviticus. And if you got it, say, I got it. All right. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd of the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male without defect, He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand uh, on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement. There it is, on his behalf. The word atonement means covered. That's what it means, covered. When we sin against God, we owe him When we sin against uh, another person, we owe them. And we have a modern cultural expression that matches what atonement means. I'm thrilled to throw this out to you to help us. For example, if we go to lunch and you forget your wallet, the restaurant doesn't say, well, that's okay, bye-bye, have a nice day. That doesn't happen. Why? You owe the restaurant. I owe the restaurant, right? Right? But if I say to you who have forgotten your wallet at lunch, I got you covered, what does it mean? There it is. That's atonement. It means I pay the price. I pay what you owe. This is how sacrifice works in the Old Testament and Leviticus. The sacrifice made atonement for sin. Sacrifice covered sin we're never told exactly how this works or why it works it's just the way it is don't get too boggled down on that because that's much of the bible how does a how does a man who lived 2000 years ago who claimed to be god die on a roman cross naked wipe away and take care of our sin speaking of jesus Hebrews 7.26 says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. Jesus, hear the word of God speaking through Leviticus. God is saying to us, beloved, Jesus is saying, I got you covered. Your sin's covered. I'm paying your price. Look at me. Do you believe in Jesus? He's got you covered. Every one of your sins is covered by his blood. It's gone, paid for by him. Amen. Love him more than you do now. Number two, God provided a way to live near his presence through the priesthood. So we're moving from ritual now to priesthood. But now it's through Jesus. Chapters 8. 10 is mirrored of this truth in chapters 21 to 22. So let's go to Leviticus 10. Turn with me to Leviticus 10 together. Those of you online, follow with me. And we'll we'll pick up in verse 1, Leviticus 10, verse 1. If you say it, say, I got it. Those of you online, you got it. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron... You guys know who Aaron is? He's what? Right? Took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered, key phrase, 
strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. You could write across that verse, toasted. They became the offering themselves. Nadab and Abihu were priests. This meant they had special duties in terms of leading God's people in worship. And as the story begins, Nadab and Abihu bring an offering the Lord had not commanded. The larger context shows that they tried to barge into the most holy place, the very throne room of the Lord, without being invited. Let's put our ancient uh, Near Eastern hats on. If you barge into the presence of the king without being invited, guess what happens to you? You get annihilated. You get killed by the bodyguards. You don't do that. Barging into the throne of, of an earthly king was a severe breach of royal protocol and a tremendous sign of disrespect. We could go to Esther 4.11 to see another example of that. And the Lord himself guards his honor by sending fire out to consume the blasphemous priests. Uh, some scholars contemplate whether the strange fire was some type of Canaanite mix, some type of paganite uh, thing going on. We just are not told. It was strange fire. It was, some of your versions have unauthorized fire. Yeah, unauthorized fire. And then the Lord gives this warning in verse 3 of Leviticus 10. Look at it with me. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. And how does Father of the sons who just got toasted by God, how does he respond? He kept silent. No protest. So what is the Lord communicating here? The Lord is telling the entire priestly family, okay? If you do not set me apart by your actions as the God of worthy of reverence, I will use your death as an opportunity to remind all the people that I am indeed the God who's to be revered above all. This is heavy. This is heavy. By the way, you know what the Hebrew word uh, glory means? Heavy. That's what it means, heavy have you had times with the Lord in both personal devotion and corporate um, expressions of worship where it just seems like the presence of the Lord was heavy? Amen. We must not be flippant with the Lord. God holds those who lead his people in worship to an especially high account. We could go to New Testament, James 3, 1, very quickly, that says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. That should put the fear of God in every uh, pastor who's serving now, any elder serving now, as well as any wannabes or those who, that have a sense of calling and desire to be an elder, right? This applies to all who follow the leadership and teaching of their elders and or pastors. And, he, and let me just break this down in one practical way, then we'll move on to number three, okay? To neglect the Lord's day, which is what? Sunday is to neglect the Lord. Okay? To come and not pay attention to the teaching and preaching is to not pay attention to the Lord. Number three, God provided a way to live near his presence through purity laws, but now it's through Jesus. And it's seen in, this truth is seen in chapters 11 through 15, and it's mirrored again in chapters 18 to 20. So let's go to chapter 11. Look, it's right next to Leviticus chapter 10. We don't have to go very far. But I must ask you to say, if you're at a Leviticus 11, 1, say I'm there. We're together. Let's go to verse 1. The Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying... These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth, 
Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hooves, and choose the cud among the animals, that you may eat. Nevertheless, you are not to eat of these among those which chew the cud, or among those which divide the hoof, the camel, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. Okay? During a seminary class on Leviticus, one of the last assignments of the class was to follow as many of the laws of Leviticus as possible for an entire week. Can you imagine trying to do that? <laughs> this is, of course, something many Jews do regularly, even today. Remember I told you the story of me and Monica? You allowed us to go to the Holy Land, and on the, on, on the Sabbath, you know, there's two elevators. One was like a normal elevator, and the other was the one that you used on the Sabbath day. It was the Sabbat elevator. You also recall me, right, when we were coming back from one of the trips to Kenya, I tried to order a pizza with pepperoni and hamburger on Saturday night. And they're looking at me like, what's wrong with you? And I'm looking at them like, this is a pizza place. What's wrong with you? I want hamburger and pepperoni. And it's the Sabbath, you dumb Gentile pastor. <laughs> Don't anybody tell the seminary president or, or my seminary profs about that, okay? We've never thought twice about having bacon with our eggs. Can I get an amen? Yeah, there's a lot of Gentiles listening to me. During that week, these seminary students with this assignment, they had to keep a journal of their experience and turn it into the professor. And there were understandable uh, frustrations. One student noted, quote, Leviticus 19.19 says not to wear clothing woven into two kinds of material. That wipes out my entire wardrobe with the exception of a pair of polyester track pants. This is going to be a long week. <laughs> Other made similar observations, and by far the most common theme of the journals went something like this, quote, Every day I found myself focused on thinking about ritual purity and impurity. Partway through the week I realized that I was thinking about these things all day long and in every aspect of my life, and that's when it hit me. God cares a lot about our purity and holiness, not just from a ritualistic perspective, but also from a moral perspective. All day long in, in every aspect of life, the Lord wants me to pursue purity in my heart, in my life, in my actions. He wants me to reflect his holiness in all that I do. I've been treating holiness way too lightly. Oh, Lord, help me to be holy. This is the kind of prayer you begin to pray when you soak your mind and your spirit in Leviticus. Holiness in the bedroom. Holiness in the living room. Holiness in the boardroom. Holiness in the voting booth. Holiness in the workplace. Holiness on the street. And holiness in the church. Finally, number four, God provided a way to live near his presence through the day of atonement ritual, but now it's through Jesus. Amen. Let's go to Leviticus 16 together. Leviticus 16. If you got it, say, I got it. If you're hungry for the word of God, say, I'm hungry. Now, uh, chapter, I would like for us to see uh, chapters 29 to 34. This is in regard to the Day of Atonement. Uh, this is the first kind of introductory week, right? How many Sundays do we have in November? Anybody know? We got five? We got five Sundays in Leviticus. So this is just the introductory. We'll, we'll get more into the, uh, um, the heart of not the heart, but more into the details of the Day of Atonement. But let's, let's jump down for our purposes this morning to verse 29, where the Lord says, This shall be a permanent statue for you. He's referring to the Day of Atonement. In the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. 
For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. Do you see how um, this is atonement for the, 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 uh, the inside of the tabernacle itself, not just for the people? You see this? He shall also make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Verse 34, now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. This is the heart of the book of Leviticus. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, I like this, so he did. The original 12 disciples were Jews. And as they were Collected by Jesus and followed Jesus for three years. They were just like you and me. Who is this guy? After about three years, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They're starting to understand, but they didn't fully understand. How could they fully understand? Only Jesus is pulling in um, uh, the Day of Atonement and, and the Passover meal right before he dies. He's doing that for a reason. Right? Only he understands because it was hidden from the principalities and powers. And had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God did a rope-a-dope on them gloriously. We sang about it. By the way, Justice, great job this morning, man. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Good job, praise team. Only Jesus is communicating by that last meal what he's about to do. I told you about the scholar Jay Sklar. He said, you know, the guy that studied over 10 years of Leviticus, he said that two years into his study of this book, something happened. Something new began to happen when he was in church. This is how he explains it. Quote, whenever we sang a song that mentioned sacrifice or atonement, or the Lord ransoming us from our sin, I struggled to make it through without crying. None of these ideas was new to me. I had been going to church all my life. But Leviticus helped me to see with even greater clarity how far the Lord has gone in his love for guilty sinners like me to provide the way of forgiveness. He says, this became especially clear in a verse like Leviticus 17, 11. So if you'd like to turn there and look at that or just hear what it says. It, this is God speaking. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. It explains that the Lord allowed the Israelites to ransom their guilty lives from his judgment by offering the lifeblood of a perfect animal in place of their own. God is not willy-nilly about forgiveness. We have so cheapened and watered down sin, right? That's God's job. God, there must be things in place before God forgives. Everyone realize that? There must be a substitute Something or someone must die in your place, in my place. And in the New Testament, there must be repentance and faith, right? In Old Testament, actually. Before there's forgiveness. Now, what Sklar was picking up out of this verse, he said this. He said, significantly, the Lord emphasizes his role in providing atonement by adding an extra I in the verse. So go back. Notice, I myself have given the animal's lifeblood to you on the altar to make atonement for your lives. And so he, he reasons, he says, God turned the idea of sacrifice upside down. Then, 
it was not just what the Israelites gave to the Lord. It was first and foremost something he gave to them in his grace as a means of atoning for sin and achieving the forgiveness they so desperately desired. And does it not get better with Jesus? Amen. Amen. The Israelites still had to bring and present an atoning sacrifice to ransom their lives. In the New Testament, the offended king in his unspeakable love for us provides the atoning sacrifice for we who have sinned against him. We could, put, we could bring in Paul very quickly here, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some of you are thinking, well, I'm, I'm struggling. I need to clean up my life before I come to God and surrender. No, no, that's not how it works. We can't clean up our lives. That's the problem. Just surrender to God and say, clean me up. And that's when salvation begins. Amen. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, how did he... How is he breaking out of the Sermon on the Mount? Right? Blessed are those who are what in spirit? Poor in spirit. That's beatitude number one. What does that mean? It's those who understand and acknowledge before God. I have nothing to give to you. I'm spiritually bankrupt before you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, comma, what? Theirs is the kingdom of God. Have the whole kingdom, child. Amen. Do you know what this Old Testament Leviticus scholar does now, all these years later? He repeats Leviticus 17.11 every time he participates in communion. He still finds it hard to sing songs about sacrifice without tears of thankfulness for Jesus, the one who gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what about you, beloved? What about us? Are you trusting in anything or anyone else to save you? What are you doing about your sin? Are you like Adam and Eve and trying to cover up with fig leaves? There's a lot of fig leafing going on around in this world, amen? It's inadequate. Are you covering it up or are you trusting Jesus to cover it for you? Is there a sin you need to stop struggling with? Now, I understand how we use the vocabulary. I've used it before, struggling with it. Now, is there a sin that today you need to stop struggling with? No more struggle. Now it's time to kill it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Commit. I like to call it sinicide. Commit sinicide. Amen. Get murderous with that sin and kill it with the help of God. Not in a self-righteous, well, I'm going to try better. No, no, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Spirit does in our lives. He helps us kill sin, 